I see the sea, and the sea sees me. But where's the boat, I asked. With that, my uncle swept the two-year-old me up into his arms, took me over to the porthole of the ferry looking out into the Irish Sea. Ah, this is the boat, I exclaimed. Ever since I was a child, I've loved the sea, the waves, the wind, the unrelenting motion. I wonder what you were like as a child. Have you ever looked at a childhood photograph of yourself and caught a glimpse of that childhood awe and wonder you had for life? Well, as a child, I was deeply curious. I was that annoying child who asked questions all the time to anyone who would listen. And my questions were welcome, mostly. Like the time when I asked my mom on the bus why the man in front of us smelled so bad. <laughs> she had to keep me quiet, see a face. And there was a time that I learned that girls got periods. So I asked my dad, Dad, do boys get periods too? Caught off guard, he told me they did. And I'm still <laughs> trying to work it out. <laughs> when I was 12 years old, my great granddad and friend died. His body was put in a coffin and he was placed in the front room. In that moment, I asked, could I see him? I think my curiosity to learn was greater than my fear of seeing a dead body. And so it's maybe no surprise to learn that that questioning spirit that I had as a child stayed with me into adulthood. I'm a coach. I ask questions for a living. I get to work with leaders and ask them questions like, what's your vision? What do you want your legacy to be? Who do you want to be right now in this moment? And it's a great privilege to ask questions, to listen and to learn. And the best thing about being a coach is you don't have to have any of the answers. You just have to have the beautiful questions. There came a time a few years ago when I wasn't asking questions of others. I was prompted to ask a series of questions to myself. And it's those questions that I want to share with you today that you might coach yourself to say yes to living life more fully with curiosity and with courage. Mary Oliver, the US poet, wrote this poem to give three instructions for living a life. Pay attention, be astonished, tell about it. So I'm here with you having paid attention, not just to life, but to death, to pain and suffering, grief and loss. Astonished that I have this platform to tell you about it. Back in 2017, me, my husband John, and our three children went to our first family rock concert. It was a real milestone. A CD of the band had been stuck in our car stereo for three years, so we were poised to sing along to every single song. For the curious among you, the band was The Killers, and the album was Sam's Town. At the start of the gig, John, my husband, felt unwell, and I was not best pleased. I mean, it was a fun night out. We're meant to be having a good time. The couple standing next to us commented that he was a really bad color. It turned out he was, he was yellow like Homer Simpson. It was jaundice. 10 days later, he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Thankfully, and very unusually for this sort of cancer, the prognosis was good. And within a month, he had life-altering surgery, followed by eight months of chemotherapy. His scans and checkups went well. The kids even joked that the killers almost killed their dad. <laughs> the question I asked myself in that moment was, how can we put cancer behind us and get on with living life? And my answer was carpe diem, seize the day. I threw myself into work and my volunteering 
John, my husband, got a new job in cyber. We booked the holiday of a lifetime to Indonesia. We said yes to life after cancer. Cancer, however, said no. 18 months later, in October 2020, John died from pancreatic cancer, leaving me a widow with our three teenage children. When you're confronted with a terminal diagnosis, you can't go back and change what happened. In that moment, your life changes. It changes forever. That's when your grief begins. Grief washes over you like a mighty wave, dragging you into unknown waters like a riptide, devastating you, suffocating you, overwhelming you. When we got the news that John's cancer was terminal, the question on my mind was how am I going to tell the children that their dad is dying? Nothing prepares you for that. You see, the first time around, we had told the children all the information up front and unfiltered. When you don't tell young people the truth, they fill in the gaps themselves. We have world-class researchers here at the University of Ulster looking into the importance of these pre-bereavement conversations. It can have enormous impact on children and young people's outcomes when you have these important conversations with them. Telling the children was going to be the hardest thing, most courageous thing I would ever have to do. It was exam season. So for the first time ever, John and I decided not to tell the children the information at the very start. So I waited, waited until the time was ready. I can't tell you how hard that was, looking at them every day, blissful in their ignorance, unaware of what was coming down the line. I got myself ready, ready in the sense that it was the right thing to do. So I had to do it. I sat them down. I gave them the cold hard facts, no sugar coating. Dad's cancer is back. This time it's incurable. He's going to die. It was the most courageous conversation I've ever had. Now what? How do you get on with living life knowing the person you love is going to die? And like many questions in life, there's not just one simple answer to that. Eric Schneider, in his work on the psychology of hope, talks about way power and will power. Willpower is the motivation to keep going in spite of life's challenges. Waypower is coming up with more than one path. And that's really important in grief because grief isn't linear, it's messy. It's tidal, it ebbs and flows, each wave of grief washing over you charts its own unique journey. And if you've ever been swimming in the sea, waiting to ride the wave back to shore, you'll know there's a moment that calls for courage. That moment can be as liberating as it is uncomfortable. And that's what it's like talking about death and dying. So I learned to talk about death and dying and life after John for those of us who would outlive him. Talking about death doesn't hasten its arrival, nor does it make it any more or less real when it comes. What it does is prompt you to live intentionally in the moment. Could this be the last birthday 
the last trip, the last kiss. It prompts you to cherish the ordinariness of the moment you're in right now. I'm not saying it's not difficult. I'm not saying I didn't cry in the shower every morning. I did. What I'm saying is you can learn to have courage. Edith Eager, who survived the Holocaust, says you have enormous leeway in how you respond in any given set of circumstances. You can choose to revolve or you can choose to evolve. John and I learned to have those difficult conversations. Before he died, he wrote me a letter and I would like to share that with you. My Lisa, I'm going to see one last time. This time, I won't be coming back home. I won't be able to embrace you like I once did. I want you to have peace. You may have a long life ahead of you. I want you to be happy and continue your wonderful adventure. You see, John had been in the Navy. I often got love letters from him from lots of different ports and oceans he sailed on, longing to be reunited with me and his family. The power of having those conversations was significant. It helped me. It helped him acknowledge what was happening. It helped me feel all the feelings. And it gave me the permission to live life after death. And death is inevitable for every one of us here. It was only later that it occurred to me that each of us loves someone with a terminal diagnosis because each one of us is going to die. In the UK, one person dies every single minute. One in 18 children will lose an adult by the age of 18, a parent or significant adult in their lives. That's one in every classroom. Since TEDx Dormant began, as we saw, five of the speakers have died. And I wonder if what happened to me happened to you, would you be ready to live life after death? When John died, I was sent a poem by Maya Angelou. Not by her, but a Maya Angelou poem. <laughs> and in the poem, the last line says, we can be, be and be better, for they existed. We can be, be and be better, for they existed. I was determined that I would be better because John existed. And his words carried me, challenged me, took me in many different directions. I sought peace by walking and talking. I met with other widows who were part of a club like I was that they didn't want to be in, but were there nevertheless. I sought meaning by using my lived experience to help medical professionals have better end-of-life conversations with families in a similar situation to mine. And I sought adventure. Taking John's words to heart, I went on many different adventures. In fact, I asked 50 of my friends in the run-up to my 50th birthday to challenge me to new experiences. Since then, I've hiked and mountain biked, I've bird watched, I've learned to knit, I've been to Portugal, I've um, made a film called Walking in My Shoes, and I've been for a swim in the sea. And it was that swim in the sea that provides the perfect metaphor for life after death. The tide ebbs and flows. There's high tides and low tides. But there's a moment when that wave goes out 
and it comes back in again. Life comes back at you in full force and you have a choice in that moment. Are you going to take the wave? You can't be 10 years ago or 10 minutes ago. You can't be 10 years away from now or 10 minutes from now. You can only be right here in this moment. So I wonder if you would be ready to take the wave. I know I am. And that's why I say yes to life after death. Thank you.